Good morning and welcome to CSIS. Uh, I'm Steve Morrison. I direct the uh, Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS, and we're, we're thrilled and honored uh, this morning that we can uh, host uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, Democrat from Minnesota, to, to return to CSIS and speak here again. We've, we've had the honor of hosting her several times here and on the Hill to speak on issues that uh, are, 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 are the ones that she's leading on uh, in Congress. Today we'll be hearing uh, uh, her uh, vision of how to move forward uh, an agenda on maternal and child health. Uh, there's an important piece of legislation that she has introduced. We'll hear more about that, I expect, to provide assistance, H.R. 1410, to provide assistance to improve the health of newborns, children, and mothers in developing countries. Now has 73 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. Um, the um, uh, uh, Betty um, is a member of the Labor, Health, and Services and Education Appropriations Subcommittee, where she's championed on the domestic front health care access and improving health services, uh, issues that are front and center uh, today. Uh, in April of 07, she authored legislation to make health care a right for all Americans and voted to reauthorize the, the S-CHIP, the legislation that in January 2009 expanding health care to 4 million children. She's also a member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on the State Department and Foreign Operations, a critical position uh, from which she has used her leadership to advance uh, U.S. approaches on HIV AIDS uh, and has been a, 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 at the forefront of pressing for new approaches on, on global food security. Um, she was one of the original co-sponsors of the Global Food Security Act of 2009. And I might add, you know, in looking at what happened at the G8 summit uh, in Italy last week and the follow-on uh, by the president, uh, president Obama's follow-on visit to Ghana, uh, enormous breakthroughs on the global food security agenda with U.S. leadership uh, as a critical element. And I think much of, that, uh, much of that energy and enthusiasm and confidence is based on the awareness that there's a strong bipartisan support within Congress for moving ahead in this area, this critically neglected area of re-engaging and reinvesting in rural development and changing the way we our practices of foreign emergency food relief, but taking a long-term approach uh, at trying to rebuild the productive base in Africa and elsewhere uh, centered uh, within agriculture. Um, she's also been uh, uh, at the forefront of trying to get the House of Representatives focused around uh, an array of global health issues, and she founded the Congressional Global Health Caucus. We had the honor just 10 days back uh, to hold an event there on the H1N1 swine flu epidemic, thanks to Congresswoman McCollum's uh, 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 volunteering to host us and organize this event. This was with Drs. Fauci and Feinberg, uh, which, was, uh, which was timely and, and a very powerful event. Um, she recently introduced the International Protecting Girls by Preventing Child Marriage Act of 2009, which has passed the House and awaits action in the Senate, which I believe it's Senator Durbin is, 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 is carrying, ca carrying this legislative initiative on the Senate side. Very promising. Um, the, um, so you can see that um, Betty has, has moved f forward in her position in the House on the Appropriations Subcommittee, uh, in, in her other committee assignments, uh, uh, as, an, as an innovator, uh, as a leader uh, across a spectrum of issues. And so uh, today we've asked her to come and speak around the maternal and child health agenda, which is also something that the President highlighted during his visit to Ghana, his speech to the Parliament. So thank you very much, Betty, and thank you for your leadership. Well, good morning, and it is a beautiful summer day in Washington, D.C. I cannot believe our luck. It's actually been cooler here sometimes than it's been back in Minnesota. Go figure that one, huh? Well, I'm really excited to be here with you this morning, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here at uh, CSIS to speak about global health and specifically about the needs of the women and children in the world's poorest countries. 
But let me start by thanking and congratulating CSIS and Steve Morrison for the ongoing commitment to elevate the importance of global health. The work you're doing here to help really focus an examination on U.S. foreign policy and the health investments our country is making is truly critical and it's impressive and I can't stress how really important it is um, to me to help me in my role and function not only with, with uh, trying to come forward with ideas and solutions but also with oversight. Now many of you are here today because you're working on basic health care for women and children across the developing world and I want to thank you for all that you're doing. Your work is to help prevent needless deaths um, or in a more positive way to create opportunities for tens of millions to achieve basic life quality. And to do that in places where people are living in extreme poverty and hunger, facing disease, it is quite an undertaking. But it's all very important work and I need you to keep fighting and so do those mom and dads all around the world. So I'm going to start my remarks here with a single sentence from last week's G8 Global Health Experts Report. These are the experts now, so listen carefully to what they've told us. Women and children are among the most vulnerable groups and progress towards the MDGs related to maternal, newborn, and child health remains too slow. Let me stress again what the experts alerted us to. <laughs> progress towards the MDGs related to maternal, newborn, and child health remains too slow. Well, let's put this in another light. Because sometimes people like numbers, right? 25,000 newborns and children under five died yesterday. They're dying today, and 25,000 will die tomorrow. On into the foreseeable future. 1,500 mothers will die during pregnancy or after delivery today. 1,500 will die tomorrow and every day into the foreseeable future. So do we need to say that progress is moving too slowly? Do we need to say that we're not doing enough? We know that. And we didn't need a G8 report to tell us that. What the, G8, what the G8 should be asking is the mothers and fathers of the more than 9 million children who died last year is if progress has been too slow. Or they could ask an orphan child whose mother is one of the more than half a million women who die every year from pregnancy-related death if the world is moving too slow for help for those children. So what I want to do is kind of have us look at the question of what to do a little differently. What do we do to pick up the speed? We're the richest nation and there are other donor nations and are we doing enough to su uh, sufficiently reduce child and maternal mortality? Are we doing enough to invest in sustainable health systems? Well, in my opinion, not enough, and I know from hearing from many of you in the room, not enough too. And that's why taking on the challenge of MDG4 to reduce child mortality by two-thirds and MDG5 to reduce maternal mortality by three-quarters is something that we know needs to be done, and we know we know how to do it. The goals are all doable. We know that. But the fate of millions of women and children cannot just be a talking point in my speech today. Or it just can't be a summit declaration about we need to do more. It needs to be converted into action. With regards to maternal and child health, we need inspiring action. And that, I believe, is our biggest challenge. The ministries in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia understand that women and children in their country are dying in mass numbers and they're dying needlessly. The development and global health communities understand the problem. Everyone in this room understands the situation. And we all know we don't need to work, wait for a miracle drug or a great technology breakthrough 
to deliver a, what in essence is a package of sustainable interventions if we put our mind to it. And that we can, by delivering these interventions, literally save the lives of millions of children and hundreds of thousands of women. We're delivering those interventions right now today. It's being done all across the world. We know what needs to be done. It needs to be scaled up and it needs to be sustained. We know that skilled birth attendants are needed at all births and we know how to recruit and train them. And we know expanding access to family planning, child spacing improves the health of women and their children. And we know exclusive breastfeeding and, and immunizations for measles and vitamin A and bed nets combine to save millions of lives all around the world. And we know the work of GABA and the Global Health Fund and UNICEF and UNFPA. We know that they're saving lives. And we know a lot of the other NGOs that are out here are doing the same thing. They're saving lives. And we know USAID has been making major contributions to maternal child health as well as reproductive health for decades. Tens of millions of people are alive today because of child health programs implemented by USAID and paid for by the American people over the past 40 years. And we need to celebrate those tremendous successes. We really do. And all of you here today know every statistic there is to know. Every fact about the lack of maternal child health Every medical consequence, the human cost, the lack of data is not a problem. And I'm carrying it with me. We don't need to study it anymore. So let's look at child health, as I said, from a different perspective. What we don't know, that's the harder question. Something must be missing if we know how to solve such a problem, such a serious problem, how to save lives, and yet we still know moms and children are dying needlessly. So let me throw out a few questions, and as a teacher, this is a very dangerous thing to do while I'm still speaking. But I want you to help me with the answers, because I think collectively, we together need to figure out how to inspire people to action. So where is the urgency to save the lives of children and mothers? Where's the political will to invest in the lives of children and mothers? And does anybody know or care to even know the names, know the faces of the babies and the women who are dying at this very moment while I'm speaking. These are the questions we need to ask and answer if we're going to translate these endless reports that I held up, all the policy papers, all the strategic plans into advocacy, into inspiration, into investments, and into action to save lives. Now, I'm looking for the answers. I know you're looking for the answers, so I'm looking for you to work together with me to find them. As you know, I'm in the House of Representatives, and there's 435 other voices and votes as well. Is maternal child survival a priority issue for Congress? Well, we know it should be, but I have to tell you, I don't feel that it's a priority in, in Congress. Imagine the possibility of a terrorist attack in which five million children were at risk. We know how to prevent the attack. We know it would cost $5 billion to save those lives. Would Congress spend the money? Of course we would. Even the blue dogs and the compassionate conservatives would spend the money. But unfortunately, that terror strikes millions of parents who watch their children die from malnutrition or malaria. But that's not the same kind of terror that inspires Congress for action. A real sense of urgency may need to start beyond Washington, in the very countries in which women and children are dying at unacceptable rates. For example, India and Pakistan have billions of dollars to spend on advancing military hardware including nu nuclear arsenals. Yet tens of millions of their children live in abject misery and die for no other reason than the fact that they're poor. Nigeria, a petroleum exporter, leads African continent in the numbers of mothers dying each year. This should be a source of shame for such an African power. Where's the urgency in India and Pakistan to invest in its own citizens' lives? And if they aren't willing to make the commitment for their own children, for their own future, to make that a priority, how do I convince my constituents 
to make their children a priority. Now, this administration's leadership on this issue is essential. And the President's speech in Ghana about transparency and corruption and maternal child health and asking for partnership is essential. And it's going to be essential that we prove that in order to go to Congress to ask for any increased investments in maternal child health in 2011. But the President also has some work to do here at home to show that it's an urgency. He needs to appoint someone to head our international development efforts. And I know the vetting's going forward and it's going painfully slow. And I know no one's probably more frustrated than President Obama. But we need someone at the helm of USAID, and we needed them yesterday. So I'm sending the, the President a lot of well wishes um, that he's able to make that announcement shortly. So let's say we get that in place. How do we still move forward to inspire the political will in the United States and around the world with other of my colleagues and donor nations to do something about maternal child health advocacy? And we need to think long and hard about it collectively, together. This is an area where policy, politics, and pressure need to come together. Unless there's a new model of grassroots advocacy, political engagement, lobbying Congress and the White House, and real pressure from Americans all across this country, from school groups to civic organizations, I'm afraid maternal child health will stagnate as an issue, and we will not be successful in appropriating the increased dollars we need to do. And that's a shame, because it also diminishes an opportunity to build a sustainable global health platform in those communities. So the reality we're facing is that the political and policy success of the global HIV AIDS community has put a real squeeze on other global health accounts. That's a fact. The White House in 2010 state and foreign operations appropriations invested $7.8 billion for global health, with seven out of every $10 going to HIV prevention, treatment, or care. Seven out of $10 to HIV. That's a fact. PEPFAR has created a global health entitlement program. That means a person who needs lifetime treatment for HIV AIDS will take priority over other investments like child and maternal health. Unless we plus up child and maternal health and have that out there, transparent, where we're pushing for the sustainability and the growth in those accounts, PEPFAR will consume the dollars. Now, I'm not here to badmouth what we're doing in PEPFAR. I voted for the PEPFAR legislation. I had some concerns about it, though, because I didn't think we as a country, we as a Congress, were really understanding the long-term commitment we were making with those dollars. I voted for five, a five-year PEPFAR program, and I said to uh, Representative Hyden Lantos in committee, and I'll paraphrase what I said, I'm not making a five-year pledge. Once someone starts ARVs, I have a lifetime commitment to those individuals. So let's not kid ourselves here about what we're doing. It was the right thing to do, but we didn't look at the whole basket of global health care needs as we move forward. And now we find ourselves with trade-offs. But in those trade-offs, too many lives are being lost. Now, Congress is going through its own domestic health care reform, and all of my colleagues have heard firsthand stories from countless constituents about their challenges of accessing a quality health care. Their stories and the people who tell them demonstrate a real need for that health care. But who are the mothers and fathers and children that we're going to get to be willing to invest our tax dollars, our energies, our ideas to build healthier families and communities in faraway places. Unless we can make these lives real to those individuals, and less of statistics in a speech, tens of millions of children and mothers will continue to perish. Now last week, Nicholas Kristof in his New York Times column wrote, humanitarians are objectively ineffective at selling their cause. And we are. 
We do have the success stories, and we have to hold them up high. And I've been to many of them, whether it be Save the Children or CARE or any of the other fantastic NGOs I work with. They do great work on a limited scale based on the resources that are available to them. So we are ineffective at selling our cause at the large ramped up scale. He went on to say, quote, I also wonder if our unrementing -re focus on suffering and unmet needs stirs up a cloud of negative feelings that incline people to avert their eyes and hurry by. Just as some of you have started to do with the speech that I'm giving. <laughs> He goes on to say, maybe we should emphasize that many humanitarian successes, such as falling child mortality rates since 1990, that means 400 children's lives are saved every hour around the clock. And we should celebrate that. But we can't take our eye off the prize, to quote my civil rights friends. Mr. Kristoff is correct in his assessment when we should be championing success of every toddler who is now a teenager because of access to basic health care, good nutrition, and clean water, and we need to tell that story at the same time we're asking for more help to help more children. Hundreds of thousands of American citizens are contributing. They're contributing to you through their own money to make a difference in the world. Now, we know there are many competing development challenges that require resources, and I mentioned one of them, HIV AIDS. And they collectively, uh, but, but together, we need to look at that and say, how do we collectively use those to contribute to making poor countries healthier, more successful, and better prepared to meet their current obligations and future opportunities? Whether it's basic education or agriculture or development, clean water, maternal health, child health, we need to make smarter investments that produce results we can show up, hold up, and celebrate, and then demonstrate to the American people that when we work together, real improvements happen. We make a difference in a family, a community, and a nation becoming more stable. And that means a healthier, more peaceful world for all of our children. So let me conclude by asking for some of your ideas and suggestions in the Q&A about how to mobilize and how to inspire action from the American people, as well as from foreign leaders, to make maternal child health a global priority. We need to have a dialogue with NGOs, donors, and policymakers. And we need to have that dialogue saying, what are you going to do to help energize? What are you going to do to help mobilize? And what are you going to do to help communicate more effectively on this issue? Now, I do have a bill. My name's on it. But the credit goes to so many of you here in this room. H.R. 1410, the Newborn Child and Mother Survival Act, which authorizes a U.S. strategy to reduce child and mortality and maternal mortality and to be implemented by USAID. But a bill's not good enough. We need a champion. We need a movement in support of the millions of children and women's lives we can save if we only try to mobilize more effectively. We need action in Congress and in parliaments and in donor countries. And we need action in the developing countries to make this a priority. We need to organize parents here, and we need to organize parents in the developing countries. We need to organize children here, and we need to order, organize children in developing countries to become activists. We need to motivate and mobilize a political movement that will create the support for resources that will allow investments in interventions that we know save lives, that we know change communities, and we know will transform our future to be a more successful and peaceful and healthier future on this planet. Now, I'm committed to making pregnancy and childbirth and newborn start in this world safe and healthy and a joy for every family, here at home and around the country. But even the poorest families in the poorest of countries turn to the United States and turn to us and look for us for the leadership, look for us for the accountability, look for us for the stabilization, look to us for the dollars to make this a reality. So I know we have a lot of work to do, but we have a lot of successes to build that work on. And so I'm going to ask you, as part of the Q&A, tell me what you think we need to do 
to take this book filled with data and statistics, to take this book that has plans, put it on the table and say, make it happen now. We're not waiting another day. We're not waiting another year. We're not waiting another moment. Because if countries are going to be healthy, if they have a chance of even aspiring to have sustainable governments, they need to have a healthy population. And that starts with pregnancy, and that starts with birth, and I know it starts with a lot of the work you do here in the room. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very eloquent, powerful statement. Um, there has been a significant and so, in some ways a sort of surprising upsurge of interest and momentum around these issues. And uh, the fact that the, the White House and the President himself is engaged in this is terribly important. The uh, Putting this front and center within the Global Health Initiative, making this part of the speech and activities in, in Ghana, getting getting keeping the G8 focused in, in this way. Um, and, we, and we see other, uh, we see momentum coming from other directions as well. I think the picture, I mean, this is a moment when it seems to me there is the possibility for, for moving forward in a significant fashion, that the, you're not starting from scratch. You're starting from a moment of, of a significant upsurge of interest coming from a variety of directions and many coming from many sources that are quite important in being able to carry things, carry things forward. Um, why don't we uh, take uh, three quick comments and questions, and then we'll come back to Congresswoman McCollum for discussion, and we'll do another round. We've got a little bit of time. We have microphones. I'd like you to just identify yourself, and then try to keep your intervention fairly succinct. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm Dunyo Luwale from AED. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman. I'm from one of the countries that you mentioned, that women are shamefully dying, and yet the resources are in country. And I cannot agree with you more that the urgency has to come from within the country, and that we need politics as well as pressure. I think like a decade ago, there were not too many women in the parliament in my country and in Kenya and in Uganda. But women from the United States, from Europe, came over to Africa, worked with women, trained them on how to campaign, on how to build self-esteem, on how to present their strategies to their constituencies. And today I can tell you that it has worked, it has paid off. There are many women in parliament. I think the same strategy can be applied to the issue of maternal, newborn, and child health. Let's go out there, work with the women, let them know the details. They do not understand what 1,000 deaths per 100,000 live births means. It means nothing to them but they understand that every minute one woman is dying and they want to know why. We can teach them, communicate with them, and work with them on how to present their case to their leadership so that from within we have the politics, we have the pressure, and then the United States, Europe, other countries can respond to it because I think this is too long a problem for us to carry. Thank you. We have a hand up here. We have one in the back. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Erin Hofelder and I work at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. And I'm just wondering if we don't sell our foreign assistance programs a bit short, if we're only focusing primarily on maternal and health mortality versus morbidity. Um, in my day-to-day -day work, I'm focused on a group of diseases called neglected tropical diseases, which certainly 
don't cause the mortality that HIV, AIDS, malaria do. They're causing extreme morbidity, particularly in um, mothers and children. They have um, extremely detrimental results on pregnancy outcomes. So I'm wondering how we can better incorporate um, diseases that might not have the best statistics, but also cause extreme morbidity to really sort of ramp up the effectiveness of our programs in the field. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. We have a hand in the back here. Hi, my name is Karthik Balasubramanian. I'm with the Boston. I'm with. Uh, my name is Karthik Balasubramanian. I'm with the Boston Consulting Group. You're going to need to speak a little louder. If the mic uh, doesn't, is the mic working? Sure. Uh, I'm with the Boston Consulting Group, and my question is: uh, What do you think the prospects are for uh, restarting the effort to ratify U the U.S. ratification process for the UN Convention uh, of the Rights of the Child? Well, I'll start with the last one first. I'm not a member of the other august body, the Senate, <laughs> where where the treaty ratifications take take place. I th I'm quite I'm quite I bring this up usually when I'm with other Parliament members right away that I know that we're not a signatory and how embarrassed I am. I'm also we also know the impact uh, not being a signatory to the Landsmine Treaty has also to uh, agriculture and has to. Um, you know, child survival um, as well. So I have no idea what the Senate's plans are uh, for, for bringing that up, but I think it's high time. Um, I think with uh, now I have two senators from Minnesota I know who would both be very supportive of that. So please, I feel like a whole grown up now with two senators. Um, my family's complete. Um, but I really think that we need a champion over in the Senate to, to you know, be, be taking leadership on this. So I would um, encourage you to do that. And once you find out who that person is, let me know. I'll adopt him as my third senator <laughs> if it isn't one of my two. Um, I'm going to kind of take these in reverse. Uh, I was going to in reverse order, but then I thought, you know, I think uh, your question on what do we do about neglected diseases um, to um, – my, my sister's question about what do we do to help, uh, support uh, women and communities around the world. Um, I like your idea. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is try to put together a CODEL. And it, it doesn't necessarily just have to be women, I think, because uh, we need some of our brothers to talk to our other brothers. Um, just but focus on maternal child health, showing what we can do and what happens when we have sustainability bro uh, into the into the problem um, is, is a big, not having sustainability built into some of these is, is a huge problem. And the only way we're going to have sustainability is for the countries to be engaged. And we did that rather successfully actually with parliamentarians. The World Bank sponsored um, some things uh, on HIV AIDS to get uh, international parliamentarians and some of the recipient countries to sit under the tree and to talk about AIDS and to be more open about how it's transmitted and that people need to be tested. We can do the same thing. I, th I like your idea of, uh, of me, me being more thoughtful with some of the other donor parliamentarians I know to be more engaged with DFID and the rest about how do we really make this person to person um, what it should be and empower those parliamentarian leaders um, to, to action. How to empower women to action. But we know women are carrying the water. Um, they're uh, attending the children. Um, they're, in the, they're in the fields. But I meet the most amazing women wherever I go. They always have time for their children. And they always have time to support one another. So I think this is totally doable even in their busy lives if they're given some tools in which to help organize. So thank you for your suggestion. When we build sustainability into these programs and when we look at maternal child health, what do we mean when we look at maternal child health? Yeah, we're talking about birth attendance. We're talking about vaccines. But if a child is going to grow up to be healthy, that child needs what? food and water. This is how do we build an integrated system in which sustainability is part of it. So I don't see that what the President's doing in agriculture as being in any kind of competition what we're doing on child survival. I push for, and I was part of a panel here at CSIS, <laughs> to talk about the three Ds, defense, development, and uh, diplomacy and wanted us to have a real strong leg, a three-legged stool with um, someone heading up development. Um, I don't think we're going to see a Secretary of Development. Um, 
I think we'll see one in my lifetime. I'm going to be positive, but I don't think I'm going to see one in the next two or three years. But we really need to have a development strategy which integrates all these things that, that you were talking about so that we create a ladder up. And quite often we create a step stool and they, we forget to put the other rings on the stool so, rungs so people can move up. Or after people are on the top of the step stool, we go, oh, we're going over here now. And we're not making sure that your government has something, you know, in partnership to keep this sustainable. And we pull the step stool away. And we can't afford to do that anymore. We have to be so much smarter. And we are smarter than that. Now we just have to have the will to do something about it. We have um, a couple of, uh, we have hands up. Uh, there's one in the this back. This side of the room is a lot more awake than the other side <laughs> of the room. <laughs> Maurice. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for your speech and for being such a, an incredible champion of maternal, child, and reproductive health. I, I want to make three suggestions. Um, one is uh, a direct appeal to the President and to Mrs. Obama. They just came back from the uh, Child and Reproductive Health uh, Hospital in Ghana. And it would seem to be a propitious moment to make a direct appeal to them uh, to extend their commit the president's commitment to maternal and child health. And we were a little disappointed in the budget that he put forward this year, as you know. Uh, a second suggestion would be to make better use of the Institute of Medicine uh, report that came out. Um, that report came out. It has some very important recommendations. It makes it clear that it's in the U.S. interest uh, to make these investments. Uh, but there hasn't been much action in response to that report. Uh, and my third suggestion would be to have a report card on health performance. Uh, if we do an annual report card on human rights, uh, this seems to, uh, there is a, such a body mm. of law and of treaties around uh, health that there ought to be uh, a, a public report card, whether emanating from civil society or from government, uh, that scores governments on whether or not they're living up to their commitments. No, I think that's a really good idea. Um, I like the idea of the annual report on health, and I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel to do that. The World Bank collects a lot of those statistics, and uh, so I'm going to follow up and, and talk to the World Bank and see if they can help us kind of start maybe um, launching, launching something up. Because if we wait to build a bureaucracy to do a report, remember I said, we have all the statistics we need, um, and they have, you know, the what's going on with, with the governments by economy by economy um, there. Maybe I can work with them to see if they'll, they'll do a poor to the poor uh, annual report and kind of look back a couple years so we kind of have a base, base to work off. I, I, I like that idea and working. And then we can show the women in the village and the parliamentarians in a very transparent fashion. We're willing to do th – th th this is a partnership. This is not about a handout. I can't think of anything more disappointing than, than, to, than, to have, than to have a handout. When you want to help your family, you want to build sustainability into it. You want a partnership. I wanted a, to be a partner with my children's schools. I want to be, to the best of my ability, a partner with my children's health care providers when they were young. I wanted to be a partner with my, my community in making the playgrounds and the neighborhoods safe. And that's how we have to look at this. We have to look at this as a partnership. Um, because if we do it in that way, I truly believe people will, in, in the recipient countries, will become more excited about being engaged with us. They deserve to have this done in a respectful fashion because I have never met one parent who hasn't wanted to do what's best for their children if given an opportunity. And we have to respect those parents' rights to be given an opportunity to have a healthy family. And so um, I like the idea of the report card to empower those parents within their own governments as well as empower our own government um, to do what we should be doing um, we can, we can, Bob Gates is with the Secretary of Defense, thinks it's a smart investment of money. We should be listening to him on this, on this particular reason for sure. <laughs> Let's take a couple of different comments. We have a woman in the, in the middle there, please. And if the microphone's not working, let's, we have other ones. It's okay. important for the 
videotaping that the mics be working. So is this working? Yeah, that's okay. working. Good. Thank you for your um, comments on integration. Um, it's a very difficult thing for people, for many people, to grasp this integration, and a hard thing to advocate for many times. Something like AIDS, where you can show the statistics and show the people dying quite easily, is much easier to advocate for. And so I was just wondering what you see as the future for integration across a wide spectrum, so that somebody could walk into a health clinic, regardless of the fact whether they're male, female, children, mothers, um, and get the health care they need. Um, and I just wondered what, in Congress, what you see as, as the future and if people are, in fact, getting on board with this. I know that President Obama is. Um, and I was just wondering what your thoughts on that were. Right. Thank you. Okay. You're up front here. And we'll move to the center in the next one. Uh, hi. Keith Hansen from the World Bank. Thank you very much for your Yeah, that was a nice plug this. I gave you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, very much in line with this comment, just to note that um, I think AIDS has succeeded largely because there is a magic bullet that can be delivered that incontrovertibly saves lives and can be easily counted, but can also be delivered largely t uh, outside of formal health systems. Uh, child health and especially maternal health, the only way to solve these sustainably is by strengthening systems. And I, I think our, our message in the World Bank, and one I know you're pushing, and I think all the agencies need to follow, is this next stage of expanding the approach to global health can't rely on, um, on on magic bullets or quick fixes. This is really the time we need to strengthen systems as a whole, especially maternal mortality. It's an excellent proxy for the overall strength of the system, and that's we have we need to take a longer view and, in some sense, be impatient with results, but patient with the kind of structural work that needs to be done in order to make this last and not be a flash in the pan. Thank you. Let's take one more over here in the corner, and we'll come back to you. Hi, my name is Michaela Hennig. I'm an intern with Representative Ed Perlmutter's office. I had the opportunity last year to advocate for the Child um, Marriage Act of 2008, and I'm thrilled to see its passage in this Congress. Um, my question, and I'd like to thank you for your comment about engaging our brothers in this issue. From my limited experience um, so far as a college student, my frustration with family planning, reproductive health, and maternal health care in the United States and abroad is that we're only reaching half of the population. So how do we frame this issue not only as a women's issue, but also as a people's issue? That's really good. Um, Earls are, we were having the first congressional ever women's softball game. You all want to miss it. I don't know what my, I don't know where I am in the starting lineup. And Earl's been one of our coaches. So we, we, we used our brother's expertise to kind of, we'll see if the guys are kind of like walking off the field after a while. One more plug on that, the average age of our competition is 25, and ours is double that. Okay. Um, I was just in Peru, and I was going back to kind of see what, what was happening with some of our maternal child uh, health projects. And I was in a village uh, outside of Cusco where they had integrated uh, the whole community similar to another project I had seen in, in another part of an Ayacucho, Peru. Um, um, and it's the engagement of the community, engaging the men in it, that, that, that has helped bring the sustainability in it. Because um, the guys don't, I mean, they're dads. They want to see their children do well. They want their wives to be healthy af after the delivery. Um, they don't want to be widowers. And so the engagement of them is, is very important and sometimes something that we, we don't tend to do very well. But sometimes we don't tend to engage the village very well from the get-go, and that, that was to my point about, about respect. You know, in the United States, we tend to lay on a table if you're not in a water-pressurized tub or something delivering your baby. I mean, we have our tradition of delivering babies. So when we roll out our programs, that's what we bring with. Well, they found out no one in Peru was coming to the clinics. Well, that's not how they deliver babies. So they sat down, and it was USID, and uh, they worked with uh, the uh, medical school in, in Cusco, and said, what do we need to do in this village? Because the government of Peru was engaged in changing the outcome. Now, I realize this isn't the poorest of the poor countries, but it's, it, I want to use this as an example of how when you engage people, you can have good outcomes. So I, I went and uh, went to this village, uh, the women are identified, they're given prenatal counseling, they have waiting houses where you bring your own chickens and everything else. Um, they immun uh, the kids come down to the waiting houses two weeks before, they, they're immunizing the kids there. 
They have people there kind of talking about uh, best practices in farming with the women. They're talking about um, breastfeeding being best. All these other kinds of things are going on. And the dads come back and forth from the field. And then when it's time for the delivery, they go um, literally right across the street in a, in a room that they've been in a couple of times. The women sit in a very specialized stool. The dad sits in another stool. The dads put their arms out. The mom has their arms around the dad. Mom's sitting on a stool to do the delivery. And I just the happenstance was there when one of the babies was delivered. They haven't lost a child yet, but they're finding something interesting out because now they're able to collect data. Kids are doing great till six months. After six months, they're losing weight, and they're starting to see children at risk of dying. We're able now to track the fact that it's lack of nutrition, and so that's the next step in. So that's, that's putting an integrated system in together, but that's involving, involving fathers. You know, we don't do any one part of our life in total isolation. Our lives are integrated, and we have to approach this as, as integration as well. And, and to Keith's point, you know, the, you're going to measure the outcomes differently, but th we need to start scoring preventive medicine both here at home and abroad. And we haven't done a very good job of doing that. But if we're going to do that, then we have to be serious about building the sustainability and the partnerships in with the governments. And that has to be part of any plan moving forward. What will this village look like a year, three years, five years, ten years, af ten years after we're gone and we're just kind of coming in collecting more data? on how to do things more effectively. Can we do one more round? Sure. Okay, sir, right here in front, and then Dan, and then we'll, and then Ted. Hi, I'm uh, Andrew Berra, the Executive Director of the U.S. Coalition for Child Survival, and I have, a, I think, what's a difficult question for Betty, and that is, we, we have a lot of support for your bill, 1410, from the NGO community, from members of Congress, from members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. But how do we get Congressman uh, Chairman Berman, who is a supporter of child survival, he talks about it all the time, how do we get him to mark up the bill rather than wait for what might be a two- or three-year process of uh, foreign assistance reform? How do we get action now? Great question. Thank you. Uh, Dan? Right behind, and then over to Peg. Good morning. I'm Daniel Singer. I'm the Associate Director for Global Health Research and International Activities at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. <laughs> Don't count that against my time. But what's your rank? I'm <laughs> Commander. Um, as you know, we have a lot of good evidence-based interventions where we tend to fail is in the implementation and the delivery of those. And my question is, that clearly is going to require a reconfiguring of how we do global health. How do you see uh, the appropriate um, relationship between USAID and State Department and, and also the relationship between those entities and NIH and the other technical agencies that really have the health expertise? How should we reorganize to be better at getting these things to scale in the field? Congressman, thank you for your leadership and also your staff are always extremely knowledgeable and uh, accessible, so we appreciate that. I work for an organization led by a proud graduate of the University of Minnesota, and we're trying to find a vaccine to prevent tuberculosis, which, as you know, is one of the leading killers of women of childbearing age, about a million women a year. Um, but when you talk about the, the focus on HIV and how can we spread that around, I think one of the issues is, partly as Dr. Hansen from the World Bank said, you know, they're sort of seen as an easy solution in some ways there. But also there are a million Americans living with HIV and half a million Americans who died of AIDS. And unfortunately, the things we're talking about today Americans don't think affect them. So I, I don't know how to make them do that because it's really an uphill battle. Um, but one thing might be 60 Minutes did a show a few months ago on Plumpy Nut, um, the feeding for children. And maybe there's a way to, to get 60 Minutes interested in kind of a positive aspect of maternal health, such as showing how the sort of diver suits that women can wear to prevent hemorrhage. Um, can prevent women from bleeding to death during childbirth or some other maybe more positive way because Americans do tend to kind of tune out or look away when something seems too depressing. So I don't know if, if that's something that you all can help kind of reach out to people in the media and say, here's a way that you can tell a positive story. But otherwise, I'm afraid Americans will feel like it has nothing to do with them and they won't want to spend money on it. Thanks. Well, Americans do spend money 
through uh, many of the charities and churches and, and, and that. It's just that we haven't been able to harness collectively and turn those individual movements to expand those and then turn it into a political movement here in this country, much as um, you were pointing out we need to do in, in Africa and in Asia and in other parts of the world. The, the, the letting people know about successes is really important. And it's letting people also know how, if we fail to do this, how it will have a direct impact on the health, on the economy of the United States. And I think H1N1 kind of brought that up to light. That's one of the big reasons why I founded, um, I'm the founding grandmother of the Global Health Caucus, is because members of Congress and their staffs need to have information about what works, what's going on, just general education um, on, on these issues. And so we're always thrilled when CSIS comes and, and helps and, and, and does a, a briefing in that. But in, in people's day-to-day -day lives right now dealing with, um, in, in Congress, dealing with um, uh, home foreclosures, uh, health care, returning wounded soldiers, the economy, everything else on, unless, unless there is um, some place where people know they can go get information when they need to get it, and that's kind of why we formed the Global Health Caucus, and a lot of you provide that information too, kind of one-stop shopping, then then if it's not easy to, to accumulate that data, they'll walk away from it. But the other part of it is, if, you, if you're out in your constituency, and I have a constituency that talks about these issues greatly. Um, if you have a constituency that knows that they're welcome in your office to come talk about it or they need, or they need to come to your office and talk about it, they will, they will move, they will be more moved to action um, on this. So um, those of you who are NGOs here, you, it's great that you come see me up on the hill. And it's great that you have folks who um, uh, come with you to Washington every once in a while, but you should have people who are checking in two or three times a year in the district office. Invite the district office person to coffee and a round table with, 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 with some of your people who are donors or knitting hats for newborn infants and say, this is really important to us. Because I know when I go to a Lutheran church in Minnesota, and my mother was Lutheran, uh, I'm Catholic, or if I go to the archdiocese, I know that they have a relationship with a church or a relationship with an orphanage. Does your member of Congress know that? Probably not. We keep a lot of this very hidden, and we, we need to make it real at a district level so it just isn't, oh, I met with this group in Washington and I signed on to the bill so that they know that there's people back home constantly putting pressure on it. And kind of, kind of closing with, what do we do with Chairman Berman? Well, we're going to love him to death, <laughs> because I do. He has really felt like he's, he's been waiting to kind of see what, what happens at USAID. He's been waiting to see where the Obama administration is going to go with its, its, its foreign policy. He's been kind of waiting to see what's happening with, um, you know, we have the, the whole other foreign policy issue in Afghanistan and uh, some of the other conflict countries we're in. And I'm encouraging him to do while he's waiting. I'm encouraging him, and I think we should all encourage him to have a day on the hill where some of these bills are just heard. doesn't mean that there has to be a vote immediately taken on it, but so that the committee is informed. Um, and, 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 there, and there's some real discussion and there's some real action. And then after we have that day on, on the Hill where, where the bills are, are heard and all that, um, then I think we need, then we can say, okay, so now that you've heard them, it's time to herd them into some policy here. And I really think having a USAID director is going to help. Senator, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton is supposed to be giving a major address um, tomorrow, I believe, and we're excited to, to hear what that is. But um, we, need, we need the administration also to be putting some pressure on Congress to move forward. Here's our problem in the House, and all politics is local, so I'll talk about House politics. We have sent so many good ideas over to the Senate. 
that we're um, we're kind of uh, just kind of waiting for them to get caught up a little bit before we send them more good ideas. But I'm looking forward for the day when the Senate starts sending us back some good ideas. So I think Chairman Berman, uh, I, I'm encouraging him to hold hearings on the bill. I'll tell you the reason why the child marriage language was included in the last big markup they did was because of all the work that you folks did, and the f and what he was hearing from his district back home on this issue, as well as what was starting to happen with some of the media and the press. We can do the same thing on foreign assistance reform, um, and that's a given, but until that reform bill happens, children still go hungry, children are still dying, mothers are still dying. But to your point about 60 Minutes and celebrating successes, let's not forget to celebrate our successes. And you do amazing things. You really do. You, make a, you do amazing things every day with your advocacy. You make the difference in the life of a child. We just want to make a difference in the lives of so many more children. Thank you very much for inviting me here today.